The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey everybody, this is Jason from SWK. Uh, we still have a few attendees trickling in, so we will wait a little while longer to let everybody come in if they're running a minute or two late, uh, but we'll get started in just a minute or two. Thanks. Okay, so it looks like we just had another couple people join in, so I'm glad we waited an extra minute or two. So again, my name is Jason Konopak. I'm a consultant with SWK Technologies. Uh, thank you all for joining the webinar today. Um, we are going to be discussing the Fixed Assets Program from SAGE. Uh, if you are here for something else, you're probably in the wrong meeting, but I hope we are all here to learn a little bit more about Sage Fixed Assets. So what, uh, what we're going to be going over here today is just kind of a basic rundown of why Fixed Assets might be a good solution for you and also uh, just review some of the basic functions of it, how you can customize Sage Fixed Assets. Um, and then how we can actually run through depreciation, show you a demo of that, uh, review some of the reports that are available with the program, and then uh, some other administration type features that are available as well. Uh, at the end of that, we will have some time for questions. They will be text questions, so you can put them in the questions box in your GoToMeeting panel. Uh, so we'll be looking at those when we are wrapping up a little bit later. Uh, I do not think that we will be reaching the full hour mark, so hopefully that's good for everybody. We can get you on your way a little bit uh, earlier than the one hour from now. Um, so first thing I wanted to do is pop a quick poll up on the screen just to get a feel for where everybody who's attending is as far as comfort level with uh, fixed assets. So check that poll on your GoToMeeting tab and just give me a quick click for a response there. All right, so it looks like we've got the majority of our votes in already. Thank you for doing that so promptly. Uh, it looks like the majority of you actually do want to just learn a little bit more about the basic concepts of fixed assets, which is great uh, because then this will be useful for you, not only to see what the product can do, but just to see how you can handle your fixed assets in general and whether you do that in Sage or in another program. Uh, but certainly, I think Sage is a good way to go. I've been working with it for a little bit over a year and uh, been able to do a lot of good things for our clients that use fixed assets. So, uh, like I said, in summary, we're going to review the product and then do a little bit of demonstration as well. So, first off, just a, a little bit of a summary of why you would want to use this. So, for most medium to larger companies, you're going to have a lot of assets 
in your location or locations. And when you buy an asset, you spend a certain amount of money on it. Uh, that doesn't mean that you've just thrown all that money down the drain. You can recoup some of that onto your general ledger as depreciation expenses. And, and at the end of the day, that's, that's a good thing to track um, for accounting purposes. And it can, it can end up saving your, your company some money in the long term. Um, it's also, it's also can be useful for, for tracking those assets for tax purposes. You can, you can track the expenses that you've uh, accumulated to date on that depreciation and that can help you with your company's tax return as well. Um, this Sage Fixed Assets program in particular does have all of the latest tax laws calculated in place for when it does generate depreciation values in the system and so you can actually base a lot of that uh, on your, your tax reporting to the IRS. And, and, and one of the key features that this has compared to maybe some other products, but compared to anybody who may be tracking their assets just in Excel, for instance, is it has the exact specifications for depreciation methods and, and time scales and how long you, you are allowed by the IRS to, say, estimate an automobile can be depreciated over, over a certain amount of time. Uh, so all of those rules are in place to help you along and make make your tax reporting very easy for, for assets as well. Uh, a couple other features that, that will benefit you from using this program will be, especially compared to Excel, for instance, you can have the program installed on a server and then everyone within your company can then access that, well, and everyone you allow, to access the program and see up-to-date calculations and the status of assets. So you're not trying to track down a spreadsheet, even if you may share that over a network, uh, that's not necessarily always ideal. Uh, you can track the history, any, any changes that users made to assets will be tracked on in the system. So you can see what people have done. Maybe if, it was, if a mistake was made, you can roll that back. Uh, you can also set up security for access to the system. So whether that's based on a Windows user login, you just only allow uh, users one, two, and three, and four to access the system, uh, or you can set it up with a uh, login password as well. Uh, one of the most beneficial features that will distance it from your basic kind of Excel tracking is the reporting. So you can run uh, one of several different types of reports. Uh, from your depreciation expense to a listing of all your assets and their status, uh, their net book values. You can even run property tax reporting based off of that. So many, many different reports available, and, and I, will, I will get to show you some of those later on in the presentation. So with Sage Fixed Assets, uh, essentially it, what we're looking at right now is Sage Fixed Assets depreciation and then it says network. So let me explain what that is. So depreciation is our program that we have open that actually keeps a list of all of your assets uh, and their current status and how much depreciation they're accumulated and all of the information to project forward what, what is going to be expensed with these assets at, by the time they end their life. Uh, so this is kind of the main program from fixed assets. But the two other programs that are available that are a little out of the scope of what we'll talk about today are the planning program and the tracking program. So the planning program is, is useful for those businesses that in particular are, are maybe constructing their own assets from scratch. So in that case, say you have raw materials, uh, purchase materials, um, labor, all of these things go into uh, what is ultimately the, the acquisition value of that asset. So if you're building something from scratch, the planning module allows you to keep track of all of those things under the umbrella of one eventual asset, and then that planning program can send the asset once it's completed into this depreciation module as a new asset. So that's useful for kind of a, a specific company set up if you wanted to, to plan your assets that way. The tracking program 
is essentially a good way to keep your inventory of your assets. Uh, now, not a lot of people are set up for that. You can use an app from for an Android device, or you can use one of a few different choices of barcode readers that Sage can send you uh, that you use to actually conduct an inventory of your fixed assets. Uh, so you would, for instance, barcode all of your assets, scan them into the tracking program, and then the results of that inventory would then send information to the depreciation module and say, uh, hey, we actually have three of these, not two, or we don't have this asset anymore. You can mark it inactive or disposed in the system and get it out of there. So, so those, those are a couple of different programs you can use in concert with depreciation. But in my experience, for the most part, clients are using just the depreciation module. And, and that's where the, the majority of the focus lies anyway. So that's what we'll be going over today in a little bit more depth. As far as the program itself, there are four different options. You can get fixed assets light, which is essentially a single user and has a limit on how many assets you can track, a limit on some of the reporting you can do. Um, so not a lot of folks end up using that. There's a single user, which just like the light would only include one installation. So that would just go on, say, the main uh, asset accountant's computer and they could run uh, run run through depreciation themselves. Uh, but that would just be one computer but with no limit on number of assets. You have all of the same features that you would have in this version which I have opened the network version. The network version as I kind of hinted at earlier is is installed on a central server in your system and then all of your users that you want to access can, can use a what we call a client installation and use the program from their workstations. So just like what you may be familiar with with your ERP system currently. Uh, there is user licensing, so you can talk with your account manager if you are working with us with SWK, talk to your account manager about how many seats you would need for that license, uh, how many users you would end up needing. Lastly, the other version is the Premier version. Uh, that one is SQL-based versus all these other ones are a flat database file that's just stored on the server. So the advantage of the SQL-based one for Premier is that you can report on, or you can track depreciation on over 10,000 assets. Anything under that, uh, you can still use network. Anything over that, it's much highly recommended to go to Premier. And that just ends up translating to better performance uh, when using the program. Um, the Premier does also come with uh, the reporting module. And for those of you who are on Sage 100 or similar ERP systems, uh, this also uses Crystal reports for report customization. You do need either the Premier version or the reporting module added separately in order to do customized reports or create your own reports from scratch. So we can touch a little bit on that a little bit later. So let's get into the program a little bit and see how this works. So what we have right here on the majority of the screen is the asset list. And this shows all of the assets for this company. And this company that I have open, you can see on the top, is just a demo data collection called Sample US Company. And in these brackets is the name of the database this lives in named default. So I will actually do a little bit of a share of what that means. So we can open up a company. And so within our database named default, which is the, the database that comes with uh, fixed assets, you can start creating your own databases uh, if you want to compartmentalize different companies, if you have multiple companies and instances that you want to track fixed assets for. So in this demo data, there's Canadian government and a regular US company, which is what we'll work with today. So you can see there is also a training database from Sage available, and that one has some more assets in this fake bakery as a training database or training company within the training database. 
so the reason I want to show you that is just that you can create your own companies. You can create as many companies as you want here, and you can decide to, like I said, compartmentalize them into different databases if you so choose. So we'll go back to our U.S. company and, and get started here. So on our asset list screen, we essentially have a spreadsheet of all of the assets and many of the fields that correspond with that asset. So just review these very quickly. The system number is assigned by Sage. When you create an asset, create an asset through a transfer or or add an asset through an import, you're always going to get the next system number. There's no way to control what these are. And for those of you that are accountants, you may know through an audit, an auditor is going to be checking on this. So or they may, they may check on that. So it is always good to have a consecutive string of system numbers here without any gaps. You may go in and delete assets if you so choose. If you delete, say, number 77, the next asset coming in will still be number 90 or won't use number 77. But since this is fixed by the system, what it allows you to do is create your own ID for that asset, the asset ID. And that can be in any arrangement you like. It can be alphanumeric. It can be just like we have in this demo data with a six digit number increasing at the end. So whatever you want to do to, to organize your assets can be done with the asset ID. We see the status. You can see in our system we have some that are disposed, description, acquisition date. And then here, the rest of these fields, you can see how you can organize your assets. So you can organize by location, uh, what department they belong to. Uh, class is a little bit different. We can get into class in a second. And some more item or asset oriented details like what PO was it purchased on? What was the invoice for that PO? Where to come from? Serial number if you need it, et cetera. And then you'll see at the end here, we have custom fields. So you can, you can go in and create custom fields, say that what you wanted to track is not included on here. Um, you, can, you can create a new custom field to track whatever you want. We'll go over that in a second. So let's look at customizing our field. So just like we had on our main screen, we can see all of our different assets or all of our different fields. So you can actually go in, even for an existing field, you can change what it displays as. So if I just wanted to change what class was, you can, you can change that. You can change what the heading is. Uh, entry mask, you can decide how many characters that field should be. And so you can do that on your custom field, your custom dates. So in this demo data, it's already set up. Custom date number one has been changed to be the warranty date. And so when you're creating assets or importing them, you can add the warranty date into fix that. All right, so what you see on this screen in summary is a list of what Sage calls the general information field, uh, which are things that by and large do not affect the actual calculations of depreciation. But if we double click on an asset, we're able to see the asset detail screen. So I double clicked on number three, that's a parking lot in this example. So I'm able to see this asset in a little bit more detail. You can move this line around and see what else uh, you have hidden behind it. So all of our general info fields, just like we saw on that main spreadsheet are here. Uh, I will note, as we'll, we'll show it a little bit later, but you have your GL accounts here, which are important for sending the results of your depreciation calculations into your ERP system. So you always need an asset account, an accumulation account, and an expense account. And what this demo system also has set up, which we, you can do yourself, is set up what are called smart lists. So you don't want to have your users going in and entering in these account numbers, and maybe they leave out the dash, maybe they leave off a zero, and suddenly we've got bad data. So this smart list allows them to just select what has been entered before from a drop-down list. So this is not pre-programmed data by Sage. If you've got a, your own 
brand new installation of fixed assets, none of this would be here. But you can create your own based on the data that you've imported thus far. So it's a good way to prevent errors. All right, so down at the bottom here are our book fields. And this is all the data that is actually dealt with crunching the numbers for depreciation. <clears throat> all the, the ones in bold here are our critical fields, as Sage calls them. These are absolutely necessary to have entered in the system and entered correctly in order for the calculations to be performed. So they are, they are crucial. Uh, and then below that are some additional fields that will affect the calculation, but they can be left blank or, or zeroed out as their default. And everything in bold blue at the bottom, as you see from this name here, are the depreciation calculations. This is data that cannot be edited or changed. This is the result of the calculations that the program has run. So I'll step back to those in just one second. I also wanted to show you at the top of the screen here, for each asset, you get these five tabs of information. The main tab is where we are, where all of our fields are. You can see transactions. So in this case, there are no transactions on this asset. We can page back and forth from one asset to another with these arrows, and I can find one that has transactions. So this asset was fully disposed back in 2010 in this demo data. On our notes tab, you can enter notes. So you can say uh, this asset was disposed in 2010 or whatever notes you want to make. Anything that is kind of just an ongoing communication for users to be able to check that might not already be, be in your fields, in your general fields. You can also put an image of the asset in here. I'll go back to the asset list and we'll bring up something that has an image. Where are our images? There we go. So this is a Dodge Durango and there's an image attached. So it kind of lends a little bit of clarity to what you're working with and you can add multiple images to one asset. So it doesn't have to just be a picture of it. You can add, uh, for instance, a PDF of the invoice that this was purchased through. Um, you could add material safety data sheets if it's chemicals. You could add instruction manuals. Anything that you would you would feel would be relevant to have on file with that asset, you can add into there. And then history just shows a quick summary of what has happened on this asset historically. So we can see that Jay Smith changed some general information eight years ago. All right, so down at the bottom here, we'll go back to our book information. So we have the tax book. As I mentioned earlier, you can use this in conjunction with uh, your tax returns to send this data to the IRS. Uh, internal book is basically going to be what you will track and what everybody will do in, in order to put this into your general ledger, put in your, your depreciation calculation results into your GL. Uh, so you have a property type, a place and service date. So the place and service date is not necessarily when you bought it, it's when the asset first actually went to use, was actually started to be in place in a business sense for the company. What was the value of the asset? And depreciation method, like I mentioned at the outset, we have for the specific IRS calculation methods here. You can choose the appropriate one for your asset and that selection will often, in accordance with the property type, will limit uh, what estimated life is possible for that asset. So that's something that if you are interested in, in adding the fixed assets program, that's something that we can go in, go over in a little bit more depth as to which methods would be best for your asset. And then you have other books, the state and the alternative minim minimum tax correspond with your tax book in a couple of uh, similar ways. Uh, same with the adjusted current earnings book. And then custom one and two are ones where you can actually make adjustments yourself. A lot of people use one as a budget book to kind of parallel with your internal book 
or you could use it as one to play around with data and, and see what may happen when you, when you make changes. Okay, so let's go back to our asset list. And so what we can also do to organize this is we can put our assets into groups. So by default, there's a few groups that are always going to be in there, complete, incomplete, active, dispose. Uh, and I, I believe that's it by default. Then there are additional groups that you can create on your own to organize your assets. So for instance, this one for all assets in department 100, you can see in this column we've got 100, 600, 400, 200, et cetera. We just can select this department 100 and there we only see the assets from department 100. So you may want to report only on those assets. You may want to uh, export them to Excel just so you can see them. You can see at the bottom, you can export that data. You can also do more elaborate exports in, in a different method. I can show you that. So if we wanted to create our own group, we can go to Customize, Group Manager, and we can create a group. Let's say that uh, we want to do location is SL. I'm not even sure what that stands for, but we can try that. So then just a simple little utility, select our location field, there it is, say that it is, and there again we have our smart list that auto gives us a drop down. And so we add that to location SL, we hit OK, now it's in our list of groups, and it's in this list as well. And there we go, now we have everything that's at that location. So groups groups are good for organizing or reporting on specific uh, assets. And you can also create your own groups just by selecting, like for whatever reason you wanted to see just these assets, you can do the same thing. You can save the selections as a group, name that, selections, whatever you want to name it. And there you go, you can save that for next time. Go back to your complete list, go back to your selection. Okay, so what do we do if we actually want to add assets? So there are four ways to add assets. We can add them manually by going in and clicking add an asset. We can add them based on a template. We can import them from an external source, most commonly Excel or, or a CSV. Uh, and then you can also add them depending on what your ERP system is. For instance, with Sage 100 standard and advanced versions, you can add them automatically from an AP invoice or a purchase order. Uh, you just There's a little bit of setup in Sage 100 and then you can send the assets to fixed assets that way. So that can be useful. So let's go through those very quickly. Adding an asset. So now we have a blank screen here so we can type in whatever we want our asset ID to be. Remember everything in this general information here is editable. You can create whatever you like. Uh, let's imagine that we went through and selected all of this information so that we had everything complete for our asset. Uh, but I won't bore you with going through that. You select a date of acquisition. Now again, that does not have to be the same as the placed in service date. Your placed in service date can be later. Obviously can't be earlier, but you could purchase it and then maybe you'd not actually put it into use for another month or week or whatever. So we pick your place in service date, what's the value, what's your method. And I'm hitting tab to go between fields here. And you can make some changes to these as well. And you notice what I just did, I hit tab at the bottom of the input fields for the textbook, and it copied all of my information over to the other books. So that's just a, a nice little feature that you don't have to enter this seven different times or however many different books you have in operation. And then since this is a new asset, we don't have any prior information, uh, we don't have any uh, current accumulation, and in this case, the net book value is 50,000 on our internal book. With the tax laws automatically in place with the 2019 version, 
Uh, I believe all this came through with the 2018 version with, with the 168 allowance calculations. So they're the same as they were last year. But that automatically, for the tax book, put this one into uh, the 168 allowance. So that's one way to add an asset. You can just hit save and add that asset. Another similar method is you can go through, still hitting that asset add button, but you can save yourself time with a lot of this information and apply a template to it. So say this is, this is gonna be an automobile, we'll select automobile. Yes, we'll apply this template. And then it has a lot of these same fields here. So not a lot of this makes sense. It's already got a Honda Accord description and it's a Ford vendor, but uh, you get the point that you don't have to fill these out every time. You can save what you've done as a template. You can save it as a new template, whatever you need to do. The third way to add an asset is going to be with an import. So this is very crucial for my clients who are coming from Excel, and maybe if some of you are in Excel, this would be how we would do that as well. So we go into a custom import. And this little wizard helps you work through the process. So we can, let's just pick some data file, you just pick a CSV in this case. We're gonna import into our US company a new asset, and sorry if I'm going through this fast, but I just want to show you that this feature is available, not really teach you how to use it at this point. Uh, and then you can you can repeat the same import with a saved field map so that you don't have to recreate this every time. But if you are creating it from blank, you select what column of your, your data source you want to use for which field, and you can find all of your fields here, create a map, and then import the information for those assets. And I don't have anything set up that'll work with this demo data, but that is how you get started on an import. So take home point being that if you have thousands of assets, you don't have to add them in one by one. And that goes for at the start when you are first implementing stage fixed assets, but also later on when you're adding assets, especially if you don't have an ERP system like Sage 100 standard or advanced, that can automatically do that for you from uh, invoices and POs. Uh, so briefly, I can just show you that you can create these links to your ERP system. This is for at sending the depreciation calculations to the general ledger. And then this one here is for asset additions. So you can do Sage 300, Sage 100. And I believe this is incorrect from Sage to include this. Uh, as of now, they do not have that link set up um, unless you are premier depreciation. So if you have premium Sage 100 and premier depreciation, both operate on SQL and they can talk to each other at that point. All right, so what happens if we want to dispose of an asset? So you can see that some of our assets are already disposed. And then when we look at that asset, we can see everything's grayed out. So this asset has been disposed. That means that it's no longer in our system. It's not gonna be calculating or accruing any further depreciation. So this is all stagnant at the date of disposal. And we can see that was July or June 2010. So that is the last period for which uh, depreciation was calculated for this, this vehicle. Now I will show you the depreciation or the disposal report in a couple minutes. So let's say let's say we'd want to dispose of this vending machine. Snacks in there are just outdated. We need we need new snacks. So uh, this this machine has run its course. We're sending it away. So we can do this a number of ways. You can be on the asset list and select asset and dispose from your menu. Most people end up using these sidebar menus here. It tends to work pretty pretty seamlessly. So I'm opening my asset, click dispose, and then this, the disposal worksheet or, or a utility comes up here. We can select what date we're gonna dispose, and we can pick the day. What's the method of disposal? So that's kind of 
kind of determine whether we are going to get any gains or losses uh, from the sale or gains from the sale and abandonment, casualty if it's damaged. And you can you can recruit some insurance uh, on the on the back end for that if you mark it as a casualty. So let's just say we sold this one. Um, you can also do a partial disposal. So recently I had, I had clients that uh, had storm damage to their assets where mm, like 10% of the asset was destroyed. So they just went in and did a partial disposal for 10% of that asset. Now you can tab through here. You can say how much maybe they paid you a thousand for this and now it's sold and out of your out of your business. So you just hit calculate. It's going to show us what our gain loss is, and we're going to hit OK, and that will confirm. And we can go look at our transaction tab. We can see now that we have disposed of it. We have cash proceeds, and now we can see that this asset is grayed out as well. Now this one through June 2019 was fully depreciated, as you can see there. So there's no net book value, which means all we gain we gained the hundred thousand dollars from the sale, but we did not lose anything in terms of depreciation not accumulated. But I can show you that example in a report in a second. Uh, quickly, you can also transfer assets. So transfer is very useful. If you, like I mentioned in the beginning, have multiple companies in say six assets, Sage fixed assets, or multiple databases where you're you're splitting up your companies. And of course you can transfer it internally as well. So we pick a date for our transfer, and then our destination can either be our current company or another company. So we do current company, we can transfer it from this location to another location. You can go into your company setup and also change this by department or or uh, owner, whoever is in charge of the asset. For instance, you can change your transfer by field. But location usually makes the most sense, so that's default. And so we can change, transfer that from HQ to sales, for instance. Again, just like with disposal, you can do a partial transfer. So maybe only some of the asset is changing ownership or changing location. Uh, and then I'll show you here what you can also do by sending it to another company. So I can actually look at the other database. Let's take a second to find it. And there's my other training database in or training company in that other database. So you can do that as well. And let's say we're going to send that over. So we just hit OK. And that asset's gone. So now you can see it's transferred. It's no longer going to accrue depreciation in this company. It's going to do so in the other company. And just to keep it simple, I've transferred the entire asset. If you transfer a partial asset, it would create a, a sub asset number that would then still be able to be uh, depreciated. All right, so with all of that said, with how we handle assets, uh, add them, and transfer them out of the system. Let's actually do a little bit of calculation with depreciation. So one of the most useful things I like to share first off is this handy tool here, run a quick projection. So if you just want to see what this asset is going to do in the long term over the course of its life, you can just run this quick projection. And I'll stick to internal for most of our demonstration. So here's a report. This was uh, run in the background in Crystal Reports. And you can see here, this asset came into life in 2003. And this is not necessarily historical data. In most cases, it will be. But in this case, it's going to show based on the critical fields, meaning your depreciation method, acquisition value, estimated life, property type. This is what the asset will do. And this is how it will behave as far as depreciation each period, or in, in this case, each year. So it's going to accumulate 37,000 each year. And you can see it is going to increase in your total accumulation. This is a valuable building, so that's a high number. 
And so this takes us all the way into the future, and we're going to project that we're going to uh, recuperate the expense on this asset through the end of 2043. So as, as real estate property, this is a 39-year life. So that makes sense from 2003 to 2043. So that's an example of a quick projection. You can also run those for a month or a quarter and, and get that little bit more granular information if you so choose. But let's actually calculate depreciation. So I believe, I know from all of our assets here that we are in, we are gone through 2014 February in our internal book. So I am going to do two things. I'm going to depreciate and bring all of my assets through February 2014. The reason I want to do that is I want to make sure everything is brought up to date, not just a couple of the ones I looked at. So there might be assets that were individually backed up. Say they had to recalculate something. It was backed up to... December of 2013, we want to bring everything forward to this period so that we get accurate information that we're going to send to our general ledger. So what we do on this report screen is going to be similar for any report we run, um, as well as our depreciation calculation, is we're going to choose which group. Remember, we can just choose a group to run it on. We don't have to do everything. Uh, but all complete assets you can see between the little carrots here is what's gonna cover all of your assets that can depreciate. So uh, a disposed asset, a transferred asset, they are part of the complete assets group, but the system already knows not to bother uh, doing any calculations on them. So that's by and large your best bet. You can select your book, you can certainly run it for all of them in the interest of speediness for this calculation. I'll just do the internal book and we'll bring it up to date for February. And I'm not going to send it to the window. That's where we'll actually see our report. We'll see that when we do it for March in a second. Okay, so real quick, it just did the calculation, and it brought all of the complete assets, active assets, through 2014. So we're no, we know we're now ready to calculate depreciation for the month of March because all of the through February depreciation has already been calculated. So let's just do this one more time. Again, we can go through the menu, depreciate, depreciate, or we could do calculate depreciation from our little uh, side tab. So again, since we got that from our asset detail page where we were looking at this office building, it defaults to the selected asset. So we wanna make sure we move that to complete. And we'll bump this forward one month. For our purposes, for this calculation in this report, it doesn't even matter which, what date you choose, it's always gonna choose the end of that month. So we're gonna go through March. And now we will send this report to the window because we wanna see what this looks like. And here we go. I'll maximize this so we can see it, zoom in a little bit. So here this shows us that this is depreciation expense. This is what we've depreciated through March 31st. And then for each asset, we're gonna see, and I always check the dates first. We wanna see what our prior period was. If everything was through February, then we know this is good data that we can post to our general ledger. So just as a quick snapshot, what you see on this report, you've got, what was the acquisition value? How are we depreciating? In this case, nothing, so nothing happens on line one. Uh, but we've got straight line full month on most of these other ones, straight line mid month here, different calculation techniques. Uh, how, how long is this asset gonna be in service? Uh, this is only for the tax book, really. What was your, um, well, if there's salvage value, that will be listed here. So uh, that's what we can recover at the end of the asset. It won't depreciate anything that you set as salvage value. And then ultimately, this is what our depreciation base is. So this one, we're only depreciating half of its acquisition value. And then most importantly here, we see through February, let's just leave this one, 390,000 was depreciated. And then in March, this run, 
we did 3,098. And year to date, since it's our third month, you can see that's three times that because we're just using straight line in this case. It's very easy math. And then now, altogether, this asset has accumulated 399 out of its 1.45 million. So this kind of spells it out very nicely. It's a useful report. And I do recommend everybody save one of these once a month as a record. It's a good thing to have on, on file. And you can certainly page through to the end. Again, if you've used Crystal Reports in your Sage environment, for instance, this is all somewhat familiar. And you can see at the bottom what we've accumulated for this month, 8,542. So we'll close that. And then what we can look at next is say we've we've done our our depreciation calculation for this period. So now we want to send this to our general ledger. Again, as I showed you briefly earlier, there are links that you can set up between Sagefix assets and certain ERP systems. So obviously several of the Sage applications are available to link up to and a couple additional ones here at the bottom. Um, so that can be very useful, save you some time for manual entry. Essentially what you can do if you don't have one of those is run the general ledger posting report. And we're gonna see that we wanna run this on the internal book and it's automatically gonna adjust our reporting period to March because that's what we just did our depreciation calculation for. Uh, so let's run this report for March. And then these are the actual calculations that are going to go on your general ledger. So you're going to see all of your expenses, and then they're going to be bounced off by accumulation. And so those will obviously be the same so that you have a valid entry in your general ledger. And they're grouped according to what is present on the asset general information. So in this case, it would be, you know, 45 minutes or so of somebody doing some hand entry in their system to get this data in. So not great, but not the end of the world if you were going to have to enter that. And certainly what you can do is export this into Excel. So that can make things a little bit easier for dealing with it. You could import if your ERP system is set up, you could import into your uh, your general ledger entry, for example. But if you have Sage 100, for example, let me just pop this open. If you have Sage 100, then you can go into your fixed assets module and you can actually process this. Uh, so we can see from our fixed assets options window that it's going to be looking at this database. So sample US company, uh, we're going to use the internal book. Um, what I can't do, I can't fully process this because, uh, well, I could I could modify the period if we created the 2014 period in our general ledger, but uh, essentially the demo data is not going to agree with the demo Sage 100 data. Uh, but you can set up all of your um, period definitions if you have different periods and link your database with that. Then you can set up your asset accounts in here. So it's going to be looking for your uh, accumulation account, expense account, and when you run a period and processing on the fixed assets module, then that's where it'll actually pull in the, the data. Uh, but again, this is looking for 2020. I don't have that in my fixed assets, but that's all you do. And then you would have entries ready to be posted uh, with your daily transaction register in Sage. So sorry if you guys don't have Sage 100, but I assume a couple of you at least do. And that's how you integrate uh, fixed assets with Sage 100. All right, so say we have completed our period uh, and everything has been posted to the GL. What we don't want to do is have somebody go in and make changes to assets and have that mess up our data in fixed assets. 
So what we can actually do then is close the period. And so through our menu, set period close. And let's just close everything through 03-2014. And we don't need to run a report again. So that close happened. Now we can look at one of our assets and see that we have a period close. And so that means that if we were to go in and modify some of this information, uh, it would only change going forward. It would not change anything prior to a period close. And you can certainly undo a period close if you need to, if you need to go back and modify data, but it's a useful thing to have so that nothing has changed historically. All right, so I have eight minutes to the hour here. I will just show you a couple of other reports. I promised you a disposal report. So disposal, this will just show us all, all items that have been disposed. And let's just do 2019. We'll just show over this long period. Let's just report, report run for a second. And there we see all the assets that were disposed. So here's here's one that we disposed today. Uh, this one had a $1,000 loss, or sorry, gain. We sold it for $1,000 after it was fully depreciated. So yeah, yeah, so we did a good thing there. Um, most of these other ones, they were not fully depreciated as you can compare these two values here. Uh, so this report is useful for entering this information into your GL to show, uh, to first, in your GL show that this asset has reached its end of life and also uh, show your, your gain or loss from this column in your GL as well. Uh, one useful report that uh, if you're opening a company for the first time or if you just haven't changed your default, this will pop up when you open Sage Fix Assets and open your first company is your asset snapshot. So this is a, a nice little collection of dashboards show you your uh, what you've put in service this quarter, what's your depreciation uh, through each book, uh, what's your acquisition value recently, uh, in this case for each year, what have you been acquiring. Uh, so you can see some interesting dashboards of your data. And a couple other quick reports that I can show you. Uh, file listing is a good way to just see everything you have. So just a quick summary, what's the, what's the asset, what's the description, where is it from, what's the value? Not a lot of depreciation calculation relevant fields, but good for uh, general information if you want to see activity or uh, a status of an asset. All right, so that's about it for reporting. Um, there's a couple other things I wanted to show you very briefly. I actually ran longer than I thought I would. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, very quickly, in system administration, I mentioned at the, at the outset that by default, access to the program is just determined by if you have a registered user from the computer that is accessing it. Uh, you can also set restrictions with a supervisor login and set up either Windows authentication or application. So application, you would need to create users with uh, passwords. Uh, Windows would use their existing Windows account on your network, and thus you could just easily restrict or allow users that way. Uh, but I'll leave this off for now. Uh, and my last last comment I will say, if you do have this program and you're struggling, or if you are thinking about purchasing it and, and are new to trying to figure it out, not only do you have us as consultants, as a resource to help you, but uh, if I may say so, I really like the help files uh, with fixed assets, Sage fixed assets. Normally, from what I find, these, these help things are not too useful in general for software packages, but I really like it for uh, this program. So you can find just about anything you need. Um, you can find, like I just searched for property. I just want to find property types and what that is all about, for instance. So how do I, how do I choose a property type, right? So 
Well, this is just a description of the field, but if I click on this link, it's going to take me another part of the help menus. And there I can see, all right, this, these are the different classes of property that we can, we can classify an asset as. So let's see, it's an automobile. So you get a whole bunch of information about recovery time, asset life, based on when the, when the car was placed in service, all this tax book information as well. So it's just endless, uh, all the degrees of, of usefulness that these help files are. And, and some of you may agree that that's not normally the case with software, that they have useful help files. In this case, I really like them. All right, so that is all I have for you. Again, I apologize for running a little long, but we do have a few minutes for questions. So. I see a couple questions in the chat. I will answer these, and then if anybody has any further questions, pop them in there while we're still here. All right, so first question, is there a limit to the number of assets a company can have per company? Uh, no, not in theory, um, but what you're gonna run into with this version, with network or light or single user, is sluggishness and performance. So if you are over 10,000 assets, it seems like it may be a lot for, for people, but if you're over 10,000, then you want to move to the premier version, and that will house your, your fast database in SQL, and then that you can add assets to your heart's content. As long as you've got room on your server, SQL will be able to store that information. Next question, can the program calculate a per day calculation versus a per month calculation as opposed to GL? No, everything is done on a period basis. Um, it's, a, it's a concept that maybe if you could somehow rig the company setup to include 300 or 52 periods in a year, maybe we could do that with the premier version, but generally that's not done. So I, I would say 99% uh, sure we're not gonna be able to do that. And another question, is it easy to convert from a 2013 version to current versions? Um, yes and no, it's easy for us as consultants. It's not a long drawn out process. It basically we can do that in an afternoon or so. Um, we do need to have each version in between installed. It needs to leapfrog from 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So that may take a little bit of time to do, um, but I've never run into any issues with converting the data. Everything has always gone through smoothly for me. If you are converting from a much older version where we do not have access to the installations for all of those intermediate versions, then we can reach out to the uh, SAGE Professional Services Group and, and they can give us a quote for uh, a data conversion where we can then just install 2019 directly and, and plop that data in. All right, transfer function would be used when you merge two or more companies. Uh, it can be. It, if you if you have both of those companies set up and you want to merge them into one, then if you do a transfer from one of those companies, say you choose one is going to be your main company, or maybe you create a third company and, and transfer everything, then that will work. The only downside is if you do transfer, you don't have those assets active in, excuse me, in the previous companies. So I have a client that wanted to duplicate all of the assets not transfer them and, and in that particular situation we did have to just do a uh, a new import of those same assets with their up-to-date data so it took a little bit more time to duplicate them than uh, than to transfer all right uh i see top of the hour here um any final questions throw them in there i will stay on for a few seconds otherwise I want to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, sorry again for taking up the full hour. I was optimistic and thought we would go a little bit faster, but uh, hopefully that was some useful information for you. Uh, you will be receiving some follow-up information and, um, and please do reach out to us if you are interested in getting some help with your fixed assets or if you're thinking about purchasing and implementing Sage fixed assets. 
So once again, thank you so much, everybody. I don't see any more questions in the queue, so we can end it here. Uh, thank you again, and have a good rest of your day.